second trick up their sleeve is in these nuts right here. Oh! All right, party people. So as of right now, I am the only person in the world who has this rifle on YouTube. Now, of course, there will be other YouTubers who will be getting these rifles in for review in the near future. This is the Blackout Defense Quantum Mark II. I'm not the first person to have a Quantum Mark II. This one has some space age technology in the barrel and the way that it's mounted that no other AR-15 in the world has. So if you're new to the channel, starting back in early 2022, I decided to make this year the year to review as many different AR-15s in different price ranges as I possibly could. And the goal in the series Series is not only to review higher end rifles, but also to review some lower end rifles and to compare the differences between the affordable rifles, the mid tier rifles and the higher end rifles and to see if they live up to the claims of the manufacturers. And then towards the end of this year, probably sometime in December, I'm going to put a video together that compares all of them together in one video talking about the pros and cons of each. And I'm going to create three winners, one in the higher end range, one in the mid tier range and one in the affordable range. And before we go too far into the woods on this, let me explain what I mean by affordable mid tier and higher end. I'm doing it by price. Anything that's a thousand dollars and less is an affordable rifle and anything between a thousand and about 1800 ish is going to be a mid tier. And then anything 1800 and beyond will be classifying as a higher end rifle. And I think it's also important to note that when I say higher end, I don't mean Gucci all the time. There might be some rifles this year that will be Gucci. But when I talk about higher end, I'm talking about like durability, the way they shoot, how they feel, the types of parts they use, the types of specs that they have. And so far this year, you know, we've reviewed quite a few different rifles. We reviewed this affordable one here from Palmetto State Armory and I made an entire video on it on how to make a cheap AR-15 feel more expensive, which is a pretty fun video because there are some key differences between affordable rifles and higher end rifles and the way that they feel. And I went through on that video, the different things you can do to make yours feel more expensive. I also went through like a lower mid tier or a higher end affordable rifle from Lead Star Arms. And that was a fun video, fun gun to shoot as well. And about a week or two ago, we reviewed Geisley Super Duty. That was a fun video and I've got more coming. I mean, there's no way I can get through every single rifle made this year, but I want to get through some of the most popular brands that are out there and throw in some wild cards as well. Now, something I've been paying attention to throughout this year on these different types of rifles is that every rifle has a different goal in mind from the manufacturer. As an example, on the BCM Recce 14 that I have right here, a Recce rifle, their goal and purpose is to maximize as much velocity as possible from a barrel that's shorter than 16 inches without sacrificing too much accuracy, but with also making it maneuverable and lighter weight for CQB type shooting. Anywhere from 13.9 to 14.5 happens to be my all time favorite length for a barrel. And so BCM designed this to be something that you could possibly go to war with that could actually hold up to all the different types of elements, whether it be salt water, whether it be mud or things like that. And they built this to be like a tank. And the same thing applies to the Geisley Super Duty. Now those are all theoretical claims. I haven't done those types of tests. I don't really have the places to do all those kinds of tests, but that's the claims behind the materials and the barrels and stuff that they use. Well, today's rifle is very special because when I asked the owner what his goal for his rifles were, he kind of gave me a different answer that I get from others. His goal for this rifle is to be something that you could go to war with, but also something that's lightweight and fast and has sub MOA accuracy, it's kind of an interesting goal that he has because a lot of times, as you know, with a lot of AR-15s, there's a lot of sacrifices. You know, when you want lightweight barrels, you're gonna go with a pencil barrel, but you're gonna get a lot more barrel whip. And with a pencil barrel, once that barrel gets hot, them, uh, them sub MOA groups open up quite dramatically. I mean, there are so many trade-offs with AR-15s that it seems almost impossible to make something that you could go to war with, shoot a competition with, and shoot sub MOA groups with. It sounds like a crazy and lofty goal until you understand who Blackout Defense is. Blackout Defense is a small family owned business who is an aerospace company first. And I know a lot of different companies claim they're aerospace, but these guys are the real deal. Like they've had contracts with Boeing, Raytheon, and Honeywell. They've worked on projects like the AH-64 Apache helicopters, the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle, and they've worked on the payload of intercontinental ballistic missiles before. And I've toured quite a few different manufacturers' 
facilities before and their facility by far is the most advanced that I've ever seen. The only thing that comes to mind when I go through their factory is it looks like NASA. And I don't say those words lightly, but it, it straight up looks like overkill for a gun company, if that makes any sense. But it is, if you were just a firearms company, you probably wouldn't have these types of machines that they use. But because they do all this contracting, they're able to use these machines to make really high-end firearms. Once you start seeing all the technology that goes into their firearms, you're gonna look at the price of that and be like, wow, that's actually a steal. It should also be noted that today's video is not a 100% review. This is a first impressions of this rifle. Right now I have 300-ish rounds through it. Usually the way I do these reviews is I will do five to 600 rounds, then I'll do a review. But I will keep shooting rounds through it as time goes on, and then if there's ever any problems in the future, I make a second video bringing that stuff up. So let's stop wasting time, let's get into it. So the purpose of any handguard to me is to be as light as possible, but also be a very secure mounting location for not only your front sights, but for a weapon light or a laser or anything like that. And it has to do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, many companies have different ways in which they eliminate weight on these, and some of them do a better job than others. The other indicator of a good handguard is you can't get any twisting action. It can't twist while it's on the gun. Additionally from that, signs of a good handguard are a good set of bolts that really secure it in the place. Now, they've taken a couple of additional steps that I haven't really seen in other handguards before to make sure that this thing does not come off. For anti-rotation, they have these two dowel rods right here. And these dowel rods aren't just roll pins. These are a very high strength steel. You can see them a little bit better there. They fit into these little holes that are up here. And then up here on your upper receiver are two more holes. And they simply lock into place like that. That's one method that they prevent them from twisting, but there's also another. On these bolts right here, these torque down to 130 inch pounds, but if we convert that to foot pounds, it's like 8.125, I believe. If that's wrong, I'll correct it on the screen, which comes out to be about two pounds more than the Geisley handguard that we looked at last week. However, they have another trick up their sleeve. If you look at this mounting location, you're gonna notice a little piece of metal here. You're gonna notice no metal up there. The second trick up their sleeve is in these nuts right here. You will notice at each of the four corners, there is a protrusion that sticks out. So when you're tightening these down, it is pulling those four spikes in each of the four corners, not only into the handguard, but into the barrel nut itself. And I'll actually flash some photos up there of what it looks like after you've torqued these down. And what they do is it creates it creates some holes for itself to prevent it from spinning. Moreover than that, each one of these screws fits perfectly in line with each one of these grooves here, and that also prevents it from coming off in this direction. Now, that poses another question, and this was a question that I had on my mind. If these little nuts here are gonna make indentions into your barrel nut, what happens if I need to take the barrel off and then put a new barrel on? Do I need to get a new barrel nut? There is something different about this one that you will notice about it. Aside from all the visual aspects that are different, there's something else that's different. This is a stainless steel barrel, why is it black? Well, this one's actually nitrided, also known as QPQ, also known as melanited. What it does is it extends the life of your stainless steel barrel. If you watched my video on barrels that I made a couple of months ago, if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It talks about the different trade-offs that you have to make whenever you're choosing a barrel for your AR-15 on the materials and types of coatings. On average, cold hammer forged barrels can typically last 25,000 rounds or more. 4150 chromoly vanadium are typically 10 to 12,000 rounds. And then untreated stainless steel barrels are typically five to 6,000 rounds. Stainless steel is the most accurate. Next most accurate is your 4150 chromoly vanadium melanite barrels. And then typically the least accurate is the cold hammer forged chrome line barrels. Now there are exceptions to all those rules. Now those numbers are not set in stone. There's so many things that can affect barrel life, which is why companies can't guarantee you a typical barrel life. Now the other interesting thing about barrel life is what one person considers a barrel to be shot out, another person might not consider it to be shot out. So with stainless steel barrels, typically what happens is they will shoot sub MOA groups consistently for about four to 5,000 rounds. Once you get past the 5,000 round count, roughly, depending on how you've shot it, it's gonna start opening up. 
But with stainless steel barrels, they open up dramatically typically. And so you, you go from like sub MOA groups to four MOA, almost within a hundred rounds. Like I said, give or take, these rules aren't set in stone. So by nitriding his barrels, he's been able to extend the life out roughly by double. And so what he's created is essentially a stainless steel barrel that's gonna have the wear characteristics almost of a 4150 chromoly vandium. I'm not saying that it's exactly, I'm saying roughly. But now we gotta talk about a couple other things. One, why does this barrel look so much different than this barrel? This is a cold hammer forged chrome lined BCM barrel right here. This is a lighter weight barrel that I'm gonna be putting on my BCM. A couple things you'll notice on the difference. One, what is this shoulder here? And what is this shoulder here? Two, what is this shoulder here? Why doesn't this one have one? Three, what are all these concentric rings for that aren't on here? To really understand the dual taper system, it's best that I show you. Pretty much every single AR-15 barrel attaches the same way. And they have this flat shoulder right here in which your barrel nut torques against and pushes it into your upper receiver. Now, from what I'm told, the downside to having a flat shoulder is number one, when you torque it down, there might be some high spots in this shoulder, meaning when you torque it down, some areas are getting more contact than other areas, which means once this is torqued into place, let's pretend you dropped your gun, hit the barrel on the ground, it will now shift the barrel and the tight spots will be a little bit different. Therefore, your barrel could shift in accuracy. And the way that this works is you'll notice at this part of the barrel here, right before this chambering, we have a 60 degree taper. And then up here, we have a 60 degree taper as well. And so when we install the barrel, I'm not gonna put any grease on the barrel right now because I'm gonna take it right back apart. On the inside of the primary barrel nut, there's also a 60 degree taper. When we install this, you really don't have to torque this primary barrel nut down to a specific torque setting because of what I'm gonna show you in a second. So you see this part here, this is the part where the gas tube is aligned. You get it tightened up, and as long as the gas tube line is somewhere over here and around the nine o'clock position, it doesn't have to be perfect, all you have to do is take your torque wrench, your barrel nut wrench, and all you gotta do is time it. And that is torqued perfectly. And because you're using a taper instead of a flat shoulder, it centers the center of the bore to the center of the bore of the upper receiver. Then with our secondary barrel nut, we simply just thread that on. And I'm not gonna do it right now, but you torque that one down as well to around 40 foot pounds or so. And this is gonna be completely solid. And what this system allows is your chambering is back here. Because of barrel harmonics and barrel whip, so to speak, because there's so much securement right here, it minimizes the harmonics in the barrel whip in the chamber where the barrel whip is initiated. Therefore, it also reduces the barrel whip as we come out towards the end of the barrel. Next thing you'll notice is all these little grooves right here. And these have two primary functions. Number one, it helps with heat dissipation a little bit. And so these little concentric rings, they help dissipate some of the heat. But more so than that, it relieves the tension on the barrel. The thought process behind it is it's gonna recoil straight back instead of whipping to a degree. It's not gonna be 100% perfect, but that is the theory behind this barrel. Now, something else I wanna show you is when I installed this barrel, I had some layout fluid on the part that actually secures against the barrel nut. And I wanted to show you this. All right, so we're gonna pull this off. And what you'll notice is all the layout fluid on the surface of this shoulder here has been completely rubbed off uniformly without any hot spots. And because you always just realign the barrel nut for the gas tube, the indentions created by the nuts will always be the same. So your barrel nut won't get all marred up if you've had to replace the barrel a couple of times. So let's talk about what comes in the box real quick. Uh, whenever you order one of their firearms, they do give you a, a hard shell case that comes with it. Nothing crazy, just a basic hard shell case. Now, I don't have the gun in here right now because I have all kinds of attachments on it, but we did want to show you what comes in the box. Uh, your gun does come in this plastic. Uh, you get a magazine. You get a barrel nut wrench. I believe you get the barrel nut wrench. Mine did. I'm sure if you don't, 
I'm sure the owner of Blackout Defense will leave a comment below. You get these compression pads and you get a couple of tools. And you get some instructions on the compression pads and other stuff like that and some stickers. So this is what the rifle looks like. This is essentially their top of the line model that you can get. It just looks dead sexy. I've only added a couple of attachments to it. I got the primary arms one to six, second focal plane scope put on there right now. It is a, an amazing scope and you know what? It's something that you don't gotta spend a ton of money on to actually get some decent glass. So I put that on there. I put a foregrip on here. I put a uh, Strike Industries angled foregrip on here. It was just what I had laying around that was also in some kind of tan color. Um, I typically prefer like a short vertical foregrip from someone like BCM, but I figured I'd give that one a go. I threw a Streamlight ProTac HLX on here with the pressure pad, and then I have the Strike Industries Bang Band that they sent me, and the Strike Industries Pick a tinny piece that kind of helps feed the cord through so it doesn't get tangled up and stuff like that. They, they sent me, Strike Industry sent me like a box of stuff a while back and every time I do a build, I kind of throw some pieces on to test it because not everything they make is great, but sometimes the pieces that they do make can surprise you. So before we get too far into this, we're gonna do some comparisons. This is the older version of Blackout Defense's firearms. This is one that I'm doing a giveaway on. Um, we're doing a 1 million subscriber giveaway. There will be a link in the description for more details on how you can enter. There's a ton of ways you can enter. There's tons of ways that you can rack up all kinds of more entries. One of the ways is you get a special link that you can share with other people. And the more people that sign up for the giveaway under your link, the more entries you get into the giveaway. And that'll help us uh, grow a lot faster. But Blackout Defense kindly donated this one for a build series. Because I created an online course for AR-15s and other types of rifles and a course on Glocks and other types of rifles where I do builds and modifications and stuff like that, he donated this one, the older model, because I needed an AR-15 that went together more like other AR-15s that are available. Because this one goes together a little bit differently, which is more proprietary than other AR-15s. And so that's why we're doing the giveaway on this one. But I can do some comparisons against it. You can see a couple of different things. Uh, one, the handguards are a little bit different from one another, but they're also kind of the same. One being the bolts that are down here. Let me flip this over so you can see the bolts. Before they used a different type of, uh, a smaller bolt and a, a different type of system for, for clamping down. And then two, you'll notice that there is QD points right here, whereas on this one, there's no QD points. Something that's kind of fascinating about these. And we'll talk more about this handguard in a little bit because there's a lot that goes into it. But I wanted to kind of show you the difference between version one and version two. Also on the receiver set is fairly similar. Um, you will notice that this part right here where it's cut out and you can see through it, it's not like that anymore. Also, the other difference is on the bottom of the trigger guard and in the receiver group up here, you're gonna notice two holes that start here and go down here. And that's because there are some set screws here for the triggers. So if for some reason your trigger kind of gets out of spec and you get simulated full auto, that's because something's wrong with the alignment of your trigger. So in order to make things easier, if you ever have an issue, you just give them a call and, they, and you explain what's going on and they will tell you exactly how to diagnose and fix the gun. So on the older receiver groups, it was a little bit more difficult. You had to take the trigger out, adjust it, put it back in, and that was a pain, so now they just drill out those holes. Now these come in three different barrel lengths. You can get a 16 inch, which you see here. You can get a 14.5, that's gonna be pin and welded, or you can get a 13.9 pin and welded that you see right there. Now this one has a barrel that has a dual taper lock that we're gonna cover in a lot more detail. And then this one has your standard mill spec style barrel in regards to the way that the barrel nut and the barrel extension lock into the upper receiver. If you want the dual taper, you can only get it in 13.9 or 14.5. And if you want a 16 inch, you can only get it with the standard mill spec barrel nut system. So when you order something from Blackout Defense, you get to configure it pretty much exactly how you want it. Every little piece on this gun, you can make it fit your liking for what your purposes are gonna be for the rifle. So for the muzzle devices, they actually have a lot of different muzzle devices that you can choose. Uh, the one of them is the Blackout Defense Muzzle Brake. I will have a video coming on this shortly, but this is their proprietary one, and I think they have some different ones coming out in the future. The only downside to this one is it doesn't have any quick detach 
options available for like suppressors. However, there are other ones do. So this one is the Dead Air Chemo muzzle brake. When we get into the shooting footage here in a little bit, I did do some testing with a suppressor that had a chemo on it. So I'll be able to tell you how that worked. They also offer an OSS flash hider with quick detach. They also have an OSS muzzle brake with quick detach. They have a Silencer Co. ASR flash hider, or you can get the uh, Silencer Co. ASR muzzle brake, which they have their own proprietary threading system for suppressors. And then you can choose to get either the Surefire SOCOM brake or the Surefire WarComp flash hider, which both have Surefire quick detach for their types of suppressors. So if you already own a couple of Surefire suppressors, you can go ahead and have them put that on. And obviously if you order anything that's under 16 inches, it has to be pin and welded, unless you order just the upper receiver. If you order just an upper, these don't have to be pin and welded and you don't even have to order a muzzle device from them. You can get a different one put on of your choosing. For the colors, they have the black anodized, which you see right here. They also have a really sexy space gray Cerakote. Then they have a flat dark earth Cerakote. Then they have a burnt bronze Cerakote. And then they have the one that you see right here, which is the clear anodized and burnt bronze. And this thing, let me just tell you, it is dead sexy. It's the, one of the coolest colors I've ever seen. Essentially, the receiver set is clear anodized. The handguard is burnt bronze. And I believe the safety and the charging handle here is burnt bronze as well. Also, whenever you get anything from Blackout Defense, your dust cover here, it won't close when you first get it. They want you to be able to create your own notch. And so what you do is you put this closed, you can get yourself a nylon hammer and just hit it. And then it will create the little notch for you for where that goes. Moving on back to the trigger, there are tons of different variations for the trigger and I do have a, a nice little code for that. But these triggers can be had in a bunch of different flavors. Here's a couple here. Uh, this one's gonna be a giveaway trigger that I do right there for the uh, million subscriber giveaway. This gun originally came with this trigger in it, but then this one just came out and so I swapped it out. So you can either choose to get three and a half pounds or four and a half pounds on your pull weight. They're all single stage triggers. You can also choose to get them in black nitride or you can get them NP3 coated. Obviously NP3 coating adds a little bit to the price. Then for your trigger shoe, you can get a slightly curved, a flat, or the new hybrid, which is a hybrid between the curved and the flat. The claim to fame with their triggers is they're called the zero trigger, which means they have zero take up. I mean, look at that crap. I mean, there is nothing there. Now let me show you this. The reset and the break, if you blink, you'll miss it. There's the break. There's the reset. Break. Reset. It is a beautiful trigger. But one thing that this trigger does really well that other triggers don't do, these little pins right here, these are press fitted instead of threaded in. And then number two, these bolts that are down here, let me get a little closer for you. These bolts right here, they're welded into place. The part where you see is red. So essentially what they do is they get these set perfectly and then they tack weld them real quick. That way these guys, they won't back out. And then it uses two Allen head screws down into here. You tighten one down and it puts upward pressure against your pins right here. And then you use these anti-walk pins that use a Torx bit. Hammer right here, I don't know about the rest of it, but I know that the hammer is made of S7 tool steel. I actually have a bolt carrier group uh, from Sharps Rifle Company that's made of S7 tool steel on the bolt. And the reason they did that is S7 tool steel is 75% stronger than Carpenter 158 steel. So very high strength steel with their triggers. So although it looks like your standard basic drop-in, it's far from it. For their safeties, they have a few different options. You can get a 90 degree safety or you can get the 4590, meaning if you put it in in one direction, you get 45 degrees. And if you flip the safety around, you can get 90 degrees. This one's currently set to 45. And on this side, you have a longer arm. And then on this side, you have a shorter arm. One of the best feeling safeties I've ever felt aside from the Radiance, but this one has such an interesting click to it. Man, that feels great. For the grip here, they're using the Magpul K2, and you can get this in two different colors. You can get it in black or flat dark earth. Going back here to 
the charging handle. I kind of talked about these in last week's video, but you will notice that the wings of this are Cerakoted. That is an additional cost. You can get it in all the available colors except for the clear anodized. You can get black anodized, you can get space gray, flat dark earth, or the burnt bronze, and that's what these are. You notice how large these roll pins are, and that's important because that's a common failing point for most charging handles. Moving on back here, you can see that the castle nut has been properly staked right there. For the stocks, you get two or three choices. You can basically choose between two stocks. This one's the Magpul SL, and you can get it in black or flat dark earth. And then they also have the Fab Defense GL Core butt stock, if that's something that you would like as well. Inside of the box, I showed you that it came with these little yellow compression pads. And essentially what these do, they add even more pressure between the upper and the lower so you don't get any play. And if I take this compression pad out, there's a very, very minuscule bit of wobble on it. On the black one that I have, there's actually zero wobble without the compression pad, but it all just kind of depends. And with these compression pads, they don't last forever, but the cool thing is they include a ton of them with your build. These won't work with all lower receivers, but there's a little groove right here that they've machined out and you drop it in like that. Then when you put it back on, you get zero wobble. For their bolt carrier groups, they do make, they do use a very good bolt carrier group, but they don't do anything too crazy to it. They use a really good one as Carpenter 158 steel, magnetic particle inspected. We got the properly staked gas keys. And I'll be honest with you guys, I've never had a bolt carrier or a bolt fail on me in the past, but I've only been in the guns for six years or so. So I have cheap bolts, I have expensive bolts. I've never had one fail on me. That's just my experience. I'm not saying that bolts won't fail. I've seen people that had bolts fail. Um, but this one is a nice Carpenter 158 magnetic particle inspected. There's not a whole lot going on with it. It's just reliable and it works. So all that stuff is fine and dandy, but how did this guy actually perform at the range? So I took this out to the range last week. We did 300 total rounds. It's getting extremely hot outside. We waited until the sun went behind the mountains. It was still about 107 degrees outside. And, and that's really difficult for me because my cameras like to overheat. Didn't have the light on it when I went to the range, nor did I have this foregrip on it. But me and my buddy, Mr. Big Kid, put mag after mag after mag through this guy. Didn't have a single malfunction. The ammo I was using was this 55 grain 223 from the company called Igmon. It's a new company. Didn't have any problems with it at all. Also, Mr. Big Kid, my friend, he brought out his Rex Silentium suppressor out with him. It's copper, it's really cool looking, and it uses a chemo adapter, and so we put it onto the chemo adapter of here. Ran it both suppressed and unsuppressed. I noticed that the rounds on here, they eject around a three o'clock position, which is a properly gassed gun. Um, anywhere from about 3 p.m. back to about 4.30 p.m. are considered properly gassed. When I did suppress it though, it did show ejection patterns, which are common with something that's over gassed. They were kicking out about the one to two o'clock position. You know, obviously I could slow it down. I could put a heavier buffer in it. I'll be putting an adjustable gas block on here, which brings me to something else. In the video I did on the Geisley Super Duty, I asked you guys a question on why aren't high-end companies putting adjustable gas blocks on their guns? And somebody made a very good point, and I don't know if this is true, but I wanna ask you guys if this is true. Some people said having an adjustable gas block on a, on a gun that is ready to go to war would ultimately affect its reliability from being fouled up with carbon. And you know what, that made sense to me. 
but I would like to know what your guys' experiences are with that because I don't have very many guns with adjustable gas blocks. And so I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Now, some things I noticed right off the bat with this gun. For the first impressions, I didn't do any sub MOA groupings test. The main thing I looked at in this test was the functionality and the reliability, whether it be suppressed, whether it be unsuppressed, and with different magazines. Um, for accuracy, I looked at practical accuracy, meaning I was shooting a steel silhouette a little above 50 something meters away from me. And as soon as I found my point of aim, point of impact, I was looking for anything that was wildly inaccurate, which I didn't find anything inaccurate. As I was saying earlier, I'm doing my best to get as many AR-15s to test for this year. And towards the end of the year, we're gonna do an ultimate showdown at 100 yards between all these different types of guns using different types of ammo. And that way we can really just dial it in and get them all done on the same day with the same temperatures, the same humidity, all those kinds of things. Because I feel like if I did a sub MOA test in this video with this gun, a sub MOA test with another gun at a different time period with different temperatures, that that would ultimately reflect it. So I'm not gonna do the sub MOA test until later. I also noticed that as the barrel got hot, I didn't notice any differences in practical accuracy at 50 meters. Obviously it's not very long range, but this is a 13.9 barrel, which is more of that recce style barrel, which is pushing the limits of going to short barrel for your accuracy at distance, but also able to have some CQB with it. During the testing, I, I tested a bunch of different magazines. I tried it with the ETS group mag, ran just fine. I tested it with the standard P mags, those ran just fine. Tested it with the Lancer mags, those ran just fine. And I tested it with these steel magazines from C products and those ran just fine. Now, obviously I'm gonna be testing it with more in the future, but that's what I've tested it with so far. When I shot it unsuppressed, obviously this muzzle brake is incredibly loud. Thankfully we're outdoors. It just shot incredibly flat. One thing I did notice is sometimes even with muzzle brakes, the muzzle can go up or down a little bit. I noticed that this one didn't push the barrel down too far. It kind of made sure that it came straight into my shoulder. I noticed that when I put the can on it, it added enough weight to the end of it. It didn't quite negate the muzzle brake. It just made it a little bit more of an impact, but with the suppressor on it, it didn't feel like it started climbing upwards. I just felt like it was still coming straight back at me. Now, aside from a firearm having all kinds of cool features and specs with it, one of the more important things to me in a rifle is the way that it feels, or as one of my friends put it from Blackout Defense, the rifle's character. And what we mean by that is the way it feels to press it out. You know, whether you're coming from low ready to disable safety and fire, or if you're coming from high ready and then firing, how does the trigger feel when you're disabling the safety? Does it hit your finger? What does it feel like on its recoil impulse? And I will say, of the firearms that I've tested so far this year, this one has the best handling characteristics, AKA character. It just feels absolutely amazing. You know, and I haven't shot it with the light or the foregrip on it yet, but I can tell you this, as of right now, it still feels freaking amazing. I believe these are about 23 to 2400. Now, obviously these can go down even below 2000. This is just decked out in all of the bells and whistles with all the different colors and stuff like that that add additional money. Now, I do have a cool little code for you guys to use. It takes quite a bit of money off. So that'll be at the parts list. First link in the description, just like I said earlier. However, question I have for myself right now is, yes, all these guns that we've tested this year, I did not pay for with money. I paid for them with time and recording videos. Would I buy it knowing what I know now? Keep in mind, this isn't a review yet. But of the guns that I've tried so far this year, we've tried two lower end guns and two higher end guns. Got the Geisley Super Duty. We got this guy. And then for the lower end guns, I have the Palmetto State Armory, which was a their custom, but it added a little bit of money for Cerakote and stuff and a trigger. And then we tried the Lead Star Arms Grunt. Of the lower end guns, I would choose the Lead Star Arms Grunt over the Palmetto State Armory Custom that I have just because I feel like you get a little bit more for the money. Obviously, this is a tougher choice. As of right now, these are approximately the same price with codes and stuff like that. I like the receiver set of this one better. I obviously like the way that the barrel attaches on this one better. I like the trigger on this one better and I like the grip angle on this one better. Now on the Geisley trigger, I love Geisley triggers. I've always said they're my favorite triggers. This one's a two stage. I'm not a big fan of a two stage triggers and you don't get the option to choose like you do with these. I mean, not that you get to choose a single stage or a double stage with theirs, but you get to choose all kinds of other 
features. This one came with the ambidextrous 90 degree mil spec safety. So I swapped that out and I didn't like it. This one came with the wrong grip angle and I had to buy another grip to make it my own. Now, although I've only put a grip on here in a safety, I mean, to make it completely like I like it, I would need to get a different trigger. So for that gun, based on the things that it has and the way that it feels in my hands, there's three things that need to be replaced to make me just fall in love with it. On this gun, there's nothing else I need to get for this gun to make me fall in love with it. I like it more based on the way that it feels. Now, it should be noted also that these two guns are built for kind of different purposes. Yes, they're both kind of built to go to war with. This one is probably built to go to war with a little bit more, given the cold hammer forged barrel and given all the technology they put into their bolt carrier groups. Now, I don't know how this would hold up in a wartime situation, I, I can't tell you that. There's no way for me to tell you that without actually going to war. Now, in the future, I'm going to take some training classes. I'm going to run a few of these different rifles through them to see how they perform, but that's going to be a while. However, with this one, I feel like they've kind of hit all the different areas just right. But if I had to choose between one as of right now, I would choose this one, and they're about the same price. Now, on that note, my mind could change in the future, depending on how these things perform when we do the accuracy test and as I keep putting rounds through these as the year develops. And not only that, I'm still not finished on getting more guns in for review. I'm still working on getting an LWRC, and I'm still working on getting a Daniel Defense DDM-7 or something like that. And then there's a couple other rifles that I'm working on getting, and I got a couple in the shoot that I haven't even put on video yet. But here's what I wanna know. What are your thoughts on this guy? Let me know down in the comments. Is this overkill? Is this too much? Is it too expensive for what you get? Or is it priced justly? In my humble opinion, I feel like this should be priced closer towards the $3,000 mark based on how much technology and work goes into them. But they're available for a lot, lot, lot less. And that's just my two cents. But until next time, guys, I love you and you guys stay sexy.